Today, thanks to the quick action of my administration over the past few days, Americans can have confidence that the banking system is safe. Your deposits will be there when you need them. Small businesses across the country, the deposit accounts at these banks can breathe easier knowing they'll be able to pay their workers and pay their bills. And their hardworking employees can breathe easier as well. Last week, when we learned of the problems of the banks and the impact they could have on jobs of small businesses and banking system overall, I instructed my team to act quickly to protect these interests. They've done that. They've done that. On Friday, the government regulator in charge, the FDIC, took control of Silicon Valley Bank's assets. And over the weekend, it took control of Signature Bank's assets. Treasury Secretary Yellen and a team of banking regulators have taken action, immediate action. Hello, and welcome to the C-SPAN in the Classroom podcast. I'm Zach, and as always, I'm joined by my colleagues Craig and Pam. In the opening clip, we heard President Joe Biden discussing the federal government's response to the failures of Silicon Valley and Signature Banks, a topic that has permeated the news since the collapse of the two banks in mid-March, namely the security of the nation's banking system, has generated considerable interest in general economic policy across the United States. However, with words such as deposits, securities, investors, payrolls, the FDIC, and the Dodd-Frank Wall Street Reform and Consumer Protection Act of 2010, these topics can become quite confusing. And while the three of us are all former teachers, and I'd argue pretty good former teachers, economics is, to borrow a timely analogy related to the opening weeks of the MLB season, its own ball game. In this episode, we'll be joined by Patricia Cunningham, a former C-SPAN teacher fellow and teacher of both AP Macroeconomics and AP Microeconomics at Nazareth Area High School in Nazareth, Pennsylvania. While we'll bookend our conversation with Patty with elements specific to the advanced placement or AP exams that students take each May in the two economics courses, we know that this episode will yield great options for all social studies teachers to engage their students in the study of financial and monetary policy, taxes, costs and revenue, and all things related to economics. And while former HUD Secretary Ben Carson once quipped that, quote, economics is not brain surgery, we are absolutely elated to have Patty join us to walk us through the macro and micro econ content she developed during her fellowship last summer and how she uses C-SPAN to teach in her classroom. So stick around. We'll be right back. And thanks for joining us today as we discuss macro and microeconomic concepts and how they relate to the US economy. As Zach mentioned in the introduction, we've invited 2022 C-SPAN fellow, Patricia Cunningham, who's a teacher at Nazareth Area High School in Pennsylvania. And she's here to help us understand some of the complex topics and concepts associated with macro and microeconomics. We appreciate you joining us today, Patty. And to start us off, can you tell our listeners a little about yourself and your background? Sure. I've spent the last 20 years in education as a teacher, a coach, a department chair. I've had the opportunity to coach debate, mock trial, model UN at my school. And I love being able to work with students uh, in and outside of the classroom to help them develop. As a social studies teacher, I've had the chance to teach a range of courses from American history to current events. But early in my career, I fell in love with economics. While it's definitely not brain surgery, as Zach mentioned, um, it can be a challenge for students to understand as it's an integrated social science. It's always been my goal to make the dismal science a little less dismal for students by bringing it to life and making relatable real-world examples. Yeah, that's great. And we're hoping today's discussion on economic concepts and principles will be valuable for all of our listeners, but especially those who may be preparing for the Advanced Placement U.S. Macro and Microeconomics exams next month. So we're excited to hear your insight and tips for students and educators involved in uh, those courses. Yeah, Patty, as Zach and Craig mentioned already early enough in our episode that these exams are just a couple of weeks off. So can you briefly discuss the structure of the exams or share any changes that you've seen to them? Both exams include 60 multiple choice questions and three free response questions. The multiple choice questions are about two thirds of the exam score and the free response question is one third of the score. The free response questions do require students to conduct a significant amount of analysis from basic supply and demand to complex monetary policy actions. Recently, they have made a few changes to the exam, one in which is a student favorite, the use of a four function calculator. Students are also right going to face a new macroeconomic policy section that's going to bring in some of the new tools the Fed has been using since the Great Recession. 
these changes could be a bit of a challenge for students as they're entirely new and a lot of them are not included in textbooks. Teachers are scrambling a little bit here, but thankfully the Fed has put some new resources on their website that has made that a little bit easier for us. Thanks, Patty. And uh, shifting gears just for a moment, uh, we, we've made reference just a few times now that you were a C-SPAN uh, teacher fellow last summer. So can you speak briefly about your experience as a fellow from finding video clips at cspan.org to creating C-SPAN classroom resources for our featured resources site? The fellowship was an amazing experience. Um, over the course of my 20 years in education, I've done a lot of professional development, and this has been by far my favorite experience. Uh, the team at C-SPAN is wonderful to work with, and the amount of resources that are available are beyond anything I've ever um, come in contact with. Everything there is easy to find and easy to use. Each of the content areas is well-organized, so you can quickly find what you're looking for, and what's amazing is the bell ringers allow kind of a plug and play opportunity for teachers to pick and choose what they want and to do so quickly. What I also love about the lesson plans is everything is free and they're open for edit. So the Google slides, the documents, everything can be made to best suit the needs of a teacher, which is super awesome. In terms of creating resources for the fellowship, my first kind of task was to tackle organizing the materials. There was a ton of economics materials already there. So what I tried to do was plug those into the AP curriculum and then see if there were any holes or things that were missing and then try to fill those gaps. Um, I remembered saying to the team, I was going to try to find something for each content area. Um, I think I, I missed one or two items, but pretty much we have something for every single area um, in AP macro and AP microeconomics. I've also had a chance to continue working with the team um, in the fall and in the spring through, through the Community Fellows Program, which has been super great. It has. And uh, in preparing for this episode, Patty, we realized obviously there's n numerous ways that you can approach teaching the topic of economics. And with you being an expert as someone who teaches a subject to students, obviously we've arrived at looking at it through the lens of macro and microeconomics. So what we want to do here is play a clip of economist and author Stephen Levitt talking about the difference between those two concepts. And then Patty will get your take on how you introduce those concepts with your students. Economics is divided into two big camps, macroeconomics and microeconomics. Macroeconomics, <coughs> macroeconomics is what most people think of when they think of economics. It's about interest rates, it's about GDP, uh, recessions, uh, and macroeconomics is hard. Right? The economic system is complex. How millions and or billions of individual behaviors aggregate up into an economy is a question that really we haven't had all that much luck making sense of. It's, it's sort of you know made clear by some of the recent going ons. Now microeconomics is about individual behavior. Uh, it's a way of saying can I predict what you are going to do when I put you in a situation? Or maybe even easier, looking back, why did people act the way they did? And so that, that is microeconomics, the kind of thing I do. Any topic I describe, almost every one of them is about individuals or maybe firms at the biggest and how they make their choices. At its core, economics is merely the study of choice under the conditions of scarcity. Every single day we're making choices as individuals, businesses, and governments. And we're doing that based on the fact that we all have limited resources. Whether that's money or time, it all forces us to make choice. As Stephen Levitt mentions in the clip, when we're looking at microeconomics, we're evaluating those choices that we're making as individual people or businesses within an economy. When we're studying macroeconomics, we're aggregating out or totaling up those choices and looking at it from the view of the entire economy. When I'm talking about this with students, I encourage them to think about the fact that almost any topic can be looked at through either lens um, microeconomics or macroeconomics. As an example, if I'm you know, walking around the grocery store and deciding should I buy the eggs or not buy the eggs, that would be microeconomic. Basic supply and demand based on my income and based on my preferences. But if I hear a news report as I'm driving home from the store and it's talking about the consumer price index and the fact that the price of uh, eggs rose 60% last year, that would be macroeconomic. Both scenarios are about eggs, but really coming from a, from a different angle. And that's one of the things we recognize and value um, as you contributed your expertise to the fellowship program last year was just how you're able to break these concepts down that make it easy for all of us to understand. And it just reminds me of uh, my classroom experiences because I remember how important it was to generate connections to the topic I was teaching, you know, to apply what we we're learning in a concrete way so students could grasp the concept, like that aha moment when they realized that they understood what they were learning is something that will always stay with me. And so with that in mind, 
Let's take a listen to this next clip from a program that featured Philadelphia Inquirer City Hall reporter Trisha Nadani talking about the city's 1.5 cent per ounce tax on sugary beverages and soda. And then we'll get your take on it to talk about how you would use this real life example uh, with your students. So tell us a little bit more about this tax. How exactly does it work and what products does it cover? Sure. This tax is actually going to be paid first by the distributors. So it'll be paid there. And then really the question that we're all waiting to to know the answer to is how much of it is going to trickle down to consumers. Um, The tax is going to hit thousands of products. It's essentially anything bottled canned or from a fountain with either sugar or artificial sweetener added. There's a few exceptions in there. It's basically anything with 50% or more fruit or vegetable juice. Um, Or, you know, if you add your own sugar at a coffee shop, they're not going to tax you on that drink. But it's a whole lot of products. Think sodas, teas, sports drinks, flavored waters, bottled coffees, energy drinks, a lot of things. And as we mentioned earlier, I mean, similar measures have been, have been considered in other jurisdictions. What was different about this effort and how did it get passed? Yeah, it's interesting. You know, the soda tax, a soda tax was actually proposed in Philadelphia twice under the previous mayor. And both of those times it failed to gain traction with the city council, which had to approve it. Um, what really made the difference here for Mayor Kenny and why he succeeded, a lot of people think, is because he tied his pitch not to the health benefits that the tax could lead to by reducing sugar intake, but really to the programs that it could fund. And those are programs that resonated very strongly with council members. This money is going to go to expanding early childhood education, to fixing up Philadelphia's parks and recreation centers and libraries, to creating community schools. And that's what really seemed to make the difference here is that the, the mayor took this this twist on the traditional soda tax pitch. To harken back to something Levitt and Dubner mentioned in their book, Freakonomics, economics is all about incentives. As they note in their book, an incentive is simply a means of urging people to do more of a good thing and less of a bad thing. In this clip, we hear about a tax specifically on sugary drinks, which generate negative externalities, costs to society and increased health care costs, as well as decreases in worker productivity. Using the tools of supply and demand, we could analyze how this tax does you know, have an impact on the market. In the classroom, I would have students draw out these models showing a decrease in supply, which would increase the price paid by consumers, decrease the price received by producers, and then also reduce the quantity sold in the market. They'd also be able to show the area of government revenue created by the tax. This revenue is a key part of the conversation, as the Philadelphia mayor here is saying that this is an argument that we should use to pass the tax. We could use that revenue to pay for libraries, pay for schools. And so in that sense, he's saying that this would create benefits to society beyond the reduction in the negative externality. This could create a good conversation or discussion among students about how politicians can use or even misuse economic thinking in creating policy. And turning to a different economic concept in policy discussion, in uh, 2016, the chief executive officer of Mylan testified at a hearing on her company's price increase on its EpiPen, an anti-anaphylaxis injection medication. And during the hearing, the CEO answered questions about the price increase, which totaled more than 500 percent over a seven-year period. And while the CEO defended the price increases, saying that the company boosted EpiPen's availability to consumers of all means and to public schools, uh, let's listen to the other side from Representative Jason Chaffetz, Republican from Utah, commenting at the opening of the hearing. Mylan, as best I can tell from afar, looking at it, done a lot of good in the world, and they offer a lot of good products. But of the 635 products they offer, this generates about 10%. About 10% of their revenue is found in this one product. Now, they're, they're here to tell us that they make about $50 profit, which I find a little hard to believe. And that's why I think it's important that the CEO, and I appreciate her willingness to come in and talk to us, is telling us that, well, the middleman makes more than we do. We get less than half of that revenue actually goes to Milan. But here's what doesn't add up for a lot of people, and believe me, I'm a person who believes in profit, in profit motivation. You have five executives in five years that earned nearly $300 million in compensation. And this is, by all accounts, as best I can tell, one of their biggest revenue drivers and one of the biggest revenue items. 
They used to have a competitor. A competitor dropped out of the market. I believe it was 2010. I could stand to be corrected, but I believe it was 2010. When that other market, other product left the market, the product price zoomed. It just went up. So here is yet but another example of a life-saving drug that you have to have. If you don't have it, you're going to die. And there's no competition, which brings us to why we have Mr. Throck Throckmorton here from the FDA. One of my concerns, based on the, the sole economics of it, right? Basic economics. You have a generic product that's been on the market for 100 years. And suddenly you see this massive rise in the cost, the price to consumers. That would signal to entrepreneurs that there's an ability to make a profit. And when you understand that the cost of goods for the juice is only a dollar, the delivery vehicle, which is unique and, and, and it's, it's innovative, there's a cost to that too. But when the juice is a dollar and they're selling it for $600, there's some room for some profit. But if new market entrants aren't able to submit an application and get it through the FDA, then guess what? You have, in this case, Mylan, who's able to market a product, quickly rise, raise the price, bring home an exorbitant amount of profit with no competition. So, Patty, what economic concepts are present in this clip, and how do you use this clip in your classroom? This clip creates an excellent introduction to the theory of the firm and the various market structures in which businesses operate. In AP Microeconomics, we focus much of our course on perfectly competitive models and imperfect competition. Here we see an example of an imperfectly competitive firm or a monopoly. This means they're operating without direct competition, there are high barriers to entry, and they have significant pricing power. Here we see the representative clearly highlighting that some of the key issues that occur when a monopoly exists is that we're going to have those high prices that price people out of the market. This is particularly problematic when we're talking about a life-saving necessity, such as the EpiPen. Students would be able to use this clip to increase their understanding of the real world experience when monopolies exist, as well as be able to apply this to the monopoly graph, showing that we would be producing less than socially optimal and prices would be higher than they would be in perfectly competitive markets. If you were to pop out to this bell ringer, you would see there's some practice AP questions here that would allow students to actually get some real-world exposure to some sample AP questions. So with our team uh, being former teachers, I think we can all agree that it's important to generate connections through real-world examples to help those students understand complex concepts and principles. But uh, equally as important is how we deliver that information so as to make the content engaging for students. So sometimes as teachers, we really have to get creative. And in this next example, we're going to highlight portions of a program that you use, Patty, to create a resource for students to learn more about the core differences between John Maynard Keynes and Frederick Hayek, specifically their differing ideas around economic policy. These were taken from a C-SPAN program that featured economics professor Russ Roberts and filmmaker John Popola speaking about their use of rap music to help teach economics to students. So let's listen. not the ends in themselves. People work to live better, to put food on the shelves. Real growth means production of what people demand. That's entrepreneurship, not your central plan. My solution is simple and easy to handle. It's spending that matters. Why is that such a scandal? Money sloshes through the pipes and the sluices, revitalizing the economy's juices. It's just like an engine that's stalled and gone dark. To bring it to life, we need a quick spark. Spending's the lifeblood that gets the flow going. Where it goes doesn't matter. You'll see slack in some sectors as a general glut, but some sectors are healthy, only some in a rut. So spending's not free, that's the heart of the matter. Too much is wasted as cronies get fatter. So what would you do to help those unemployed? This is the question you seem to avoid. When we're in a mess, would you have us just wait doing nothing until markets equilibrate? I don't want to do nothing, there's plenty to do. The question I ponder is who plans for whom? Do I plan for myself? Or leave it to you. I want plans by the many, not by the few. Let's not repeat what created our troubles. I want real growth, not a series of bubbles. Stop bailing out losers. Let's prices work. If we don't try to steer them, they won't go berserk. Come on, are you kidding? Don't 
Wall Street gyrations challenge a worldview of self-regulation? Even you must admit that the lesson we've learned is more oversights needed or else we'll get burned. Oversight? The government's long been in bed with those Wall Street execs and the firms that they've led. Capitalism's about profit and loss. You bail at the losers, there's no end to the cost. The lesson I've learned is how little we know. The world is complex, not some circular flow. The economy's not a classic and master in college. To think otherwise is the pretense of knowledge. And you get on your high horse and you're off to the races. I look at the world on a case-by-case -case basis. When people are suffering, I roll up my sleeves and do what I can to cure our disease. The future's uncertain, our outlooks are frail. That's why free markets are so prone to fail. In a volatile world, we need more discretion. So state intervention can counter depression. People aren't chessmen, you move on a board at your whim. Their dreams and desires ignored. With political incentives, discretion's a joke. Those dials are twisting, just mirrors and smoke. We need stable rules and real market prices. So prosperity emerges and cuts short the crisis. Give us a chance so we can discover the most valuable ways to serve one another. <laughs> Uh, so, Patty, can you talk about how you use these clips in your classroom and how your students respond to them? Sure. Getting students excited about macroeconomic theory uh, is certainly challenging, and these are a great way to get that conversation started. Students really love the rap ba battles, and, you know, they have we spend several class periods breaking them down. As you hear in the clip, there's an ongoing debate about the role of government in managing the economy. Should the government be intervening or should they be hands off and let markets self-correct? Students are introduced in the clip to both classical and Keynesian perspectives, and they can begin an exploration of the various fiscal and monetary policies that could be used to in increase or influence aggregate supply and demand. This conversation today is obviously very important as we have pretty persistent inflationary pressure. So students could use this as a jumping off point to discuss, you know, should we be intervening to cool down the economy and bring that inflation in line or should we be you know, staying out of it? In terms of the, the current um, Federal Reserve policy, you know, there's tons in the news that kids can be looking at and watching in terms of Chairman Powell and raising the interest rates or, you know, this conversation of should they be taking a more classical approach and letting the markets self-correct. This isn't just important for kids in the classroom. It's pretty important for all of us to understand. As we discussed and Craig had brought up, you know, there's a lot of different approaches we could have taken to this uh, episode. And clearly we're focusing on the micro macro approach. But um, do you anticipate any other topics that might be included on this year's exams um, based on previous ones? Yeah, so after teaching the courses um, for you know over a decade, I like to make annual predictions about what the long response question will be on the exam. This year, in terms of microeconomics, uh, both me and my colleagues were pretty confident that they're going to be returning to a perfectly competitive graph. It hasn't been on the exam since before COVID, so we're pretty sure it's going to go to perfect competition, which can be really tricky for students as it requires them to use two side-by-side -side graphs and then to work through some pretty complex scenarios. For AP macroeconomics, I'm leaning towards a long response dealing with monetary policy. It's just so present in the news right now, and also it aligns with the new changes to the core curriculum. So I couldn't imagine they're going to go any other direction, although I've been surprised before. Um, this year, students are most likely going to have to see you know, how that Federal Reserve policy works, um, both in a climate that has limited reserves and now in a new climate that has ample reserves. Again, this is an important update to the curriculum that really, you know, is going to be a challenge for students, but I think it's going to be on the exam, at least in one of those free response questions. So it's safe to say that you have plenty of experience teaching both AP uh, macroeconomics and microeconomics, but uh, spoiler alert, it's been quite a while since I took or taught an economics <laughs> class. Um, so that leads me to this next question. Do you have any tips or strategies that you can offer for students and teachers as they prepare for this year's upcoming AP exams? Um, 
graphing, graphing, and more graphing. Every single day in my classroom, um, students are graphing. Um, so it's super important that they're practicing these skills as it's going to be something they need both in the multiple choice and in the free response. Uh, this is why I love the C-SPAN library. You can go out and in a matter of minutes find a short clip, have students not just watch that clip, but then use it to say, well, what graph would match this scenario? And then from there, okay, well, what would change on the model? How would we show the cause and effect relationship between variables? The more students are critically analyzing real, real world events, the better they're going to understand and be prepared for that exam. I have made several bell ringers that are in the featured resource site that allow this graphing practice, um, things from fiscal policy to monetary policy, the Phillips curve, the foreign exchange market. There's so much in the, the library that teachers can use. And just continuing on that thread, are there other tools or materials that you use alongside our C-SPAN resources? Absolutely. Um, even though the C-SPAN library is kind of, uh, you know, an unending uh, resource base, there is a lot uh, available to us nowadays. Um, so I love the AP Classroom resources. They're obviously aligned to the test, so that's super helpful. Khan Academy is great. Um, and a classic favorite I love is Mr. Clifford's YouTube YouTube channel. Um, as a former teacher himself, he makes great resources that are available, um, PowerPoints to supplement activities, workbooks. I also love, you know, using podcasts in the classroom. Um, things like Planet Money and Freakonomics are some really good resources for teachers. And then my, you know, old-fashioned favorite is just having a mini set of whiteboards. So my students have whiteboards on their desk and they're able every day to graph on those whiteboards. Um, and that's great for practice. As teachers of economics, we obviously have a really important job to make sure our kids are prepared, um, not just, you know, to pass a test, but also for their for their lives, whether that's as a worker, a consumer, a taxpayer or a voter. Everything we do in our classrooms um, it helps to better equip them for the future. Well, Patty, we want to thank you again for your time today. And uh, that's fantastic. We wish your students luck with the test as well as all of the other students who will be taking the exams later this month. And with that, we'll turn it over to uh, to Zach. We'd like to thank all of our audience uh, for tuning in once again today to the C-SPAN the Classroom podcast. To our economics teacher friends, we hope that this episode helps in your preparation for the AP exams in just about a month. And to our other social studies teacher friends and other listeners, we also hope that this episode makes it a bit easier to bring current event economic concepts to your students. And we'll continue our exploration of AP courses in just a few weeks with our live AP U.S. government call-in program on C-SPAN, and our AP U.S. History program on C-SPAN 2. Make sure you're registered for our weekly e-newsletter so you don't miss any updates. And if you do miss these programs, they'll both be made available in podcast form shortly after airing, right here as part of the C-SPAN in the Classroom podcast. You'll find all the resources that we highlighted in this episode and more on our featured resources page at cspan.org classroom. And if you'd ever like to connect with our team to learn more about what we have to offer to teachers and students, please email us anytime at educate at cspan.org. And that's it for this week. Thank you for joining us. And please remember to like and follow our podcast wherever you listen so you don't miss our next episode. Until then, thank you for joining us.